Welcome to our live webcast, Hottest Topics in Pediatric Orthopedics for the Pediatric Primary Care Practitioner. Thank you for joining us. My name is Eric and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acquaint you with a few features of this web event technology. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Q&A window. There is a large window which holds all of your sent messages. To send a question, click in the text box and type your text. When finished, click the Ask button. All questions that you submit are only seen by today's presenters. Your questions will be responded to in the order in which they were received and will be addressed at the end of the presentation. If you would like to access today's agenda, please click on the tab next to the Q&A window. We are joined today by our moderator, Dr. Ellen Davis, and our speakers, Dr. Barbara Minkowitz, Dr. Benson Fan, Dr. Mich Michelle Syrak, Dr. Mark Rieger, Dr. Tamir Bloom, Nicole Botino, and Dr. Joshua Strasberg. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Dr. Wittig, for opening remarks. Hi, I'm Dr. Wittig, Dr. James Wittig. I'm the chairman of orthopedic uh, surgery at Morristown Medical Center and medical director of orthopedic oncology in the Atlantic Health System. And I wanted to welcome everybody to our annual course. It's a little bit abbreviated this year uh, because of COVID naturally, but um, you know, we, we look forward to doing this course every year, hottest topics in pediatric orthopedics for the, for the pediatric primary care practitioner. And I just wanted to tell everybody that, you know, I'm very proud of my faculty here at Morristown Medical Center. They do a phenomenal job taking care of pediatric patients with all sorts of orthopedic problems from the least to the most complex. And the children here are really getting fantastic care. I'm sure you're gonna enjoy all their lectures. And right now I'd like to introduce Ellen Davis, who is uh, the director of the course and is also medical director of neuromuscular uh, pediatric orthopedics and will um, will be greeting you all. Thank you. All right, thanks Dr. Wig and uh, everyone out there, thank you for joining us. This is our second year um, doing this. Last year we had a really great turnout with uh, a full day, including a lot of good hands-on stuff. So it's a bit of a different format this year um, and we hope to kind of uh, pick back up next year with more hands-on. Um, so this year we're doing it a bit abbreviated, uh, primarily because nobody has that much of an attention span to sit here for a full day on the internet. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is because some, some of the feedback that we've gotten as pediatric orthopedists from pediatricians and family practice people and other primary care practitioners is that they just don't get a lot of uh, pediatric orthopedic training in their residency or training they are, are undergoing. And so we've put together, um, kind of compiled some of the most frequently seen things that we see um, in our offices uh, coming from you guys. And um, so we're going to kind of discuss how we as pediatric orthopedists approach this, hopefully give you some good uh, technical or uh, some good H and D um, pearls, uh, things to ask in your history, um, things to perform on your physical exam. We're going to try to stay away from the nitty gritty surgical stuff and, um, you know, talk about a little bit about when to refer, um, when to screen for certain things like hip dysplasia, et cetera. And, you know, essentially we're kind of giving you like a little bit of a glimpse into our world. Um, so hopefully, you know, you can kind of take it back and apply it to your world. Uh, so the way that we're going to do this is um, there's going to be nine talks and it's going to be over the course of three hours. So there's going to be three talks per hour followed by a Q&A at the end of each uh, three talk block. Um, we're going to give about 10 minutes for Q&A and then give a little five minute break to uh, refill your wine or whatever you um, the Q&A is going to be hopefully fun, uh, but that really means we need a lot of cues to be able to give the A, so we hope everybody um, participates uh, in that. So we'll move on to the first talk, which I'm giving, um, which is the basics of rotational alignment, and really we're going to be talking about um, in total here. So this is one of the most common things that we as pediatric orthopedists see in the office. And so we're going to talk about what's normal, 
what's normal according to age. Uh, we're going to go over extensively the very quick, easy physical exam to figure out where the infilling is coming from. I'm going to tell you what I tell parents, and then we'll talk about some of the treatment options. So we're talking about this because it really, uh, you know, parents come in with this complaint very, very concerned, very, very worried. Um, and so it's probably something that you guys even hear about more than us because we're only getting the ones that filter through you guys. And parents come in saying things like, my kid falls all the time because the toes are going in, or their feet are going to be stuck like that forever if we don't do something. Um, or they're going to, it's going to cause my kid to have arthritis or problems down the line, or they're not going to be uh, a superstar athlete. So when we are talking about thermal antiversion, or, uh, about uh, intone, it really comes from three places. And kind of from the top down, we're talking about femoral antiversion, internal tibial torsion, and then down at the feet, metatarsus adductus. So for femoral antiversion, the way to figure this out, how much or quantify the femoral antiversion, it's an angle created by the femoral neck up by the hip, uh, and you relate that to a line drawn by uh, across the femoral condyles in the back of the knee. Um, and, and really what that means is, you know, as orthopedists, we love all these angles and stuff, but basically the femur twists inwards. And when you're born, you start out with it uh, at a high angle, or the femur really twisted in at 30 to 40 degrees. And then by the time you're still immature, it decreases till, uh, to about 15 degrees. So it really untwists with age. And so this really becomes more noticeable um, in the like toddler, early childhood age. It's more common in girls than boys. We don't really know why. And one of the, the things that brings up a lot of concerns is this issue of W sitting in kids. Sometimes parents will also say that the child runs funny. And really what they typically mean is that if you look at them from behind, the foot kicks out to the side. Um, and we call this a, a heel whip. And that's really because the femur is internally rotating, which makes the foot look like it's going out to the side. And then if you get into like a little bit of an older category into like the kind of preteen girls with femoral antiversion, if you ask them to stand straight up and look down at their toes and tell you what you see at the knees, um, they always say that the kneecaps look like they're uh, pointing towards each other. Then the next, as we're like going down um, the leg, the next thing is internal tibial torsion. And this is the most common cause of intoning in toddlers. And it's really uh, internal rotation of the tibia. And it's caused by in utero packaging kind of in a tight space. You can see um, this baby, the left leg is sort of tucked underneath the body and the, uh, the right leg. And you know, kids bones when they're in utero, they're very soft. So if you put them in that position, that's basically how they come out. Um, and it presents usually after kids start walking around one to three years old. Sometimes I'll tell the parents it's sort of like those mattresses you can buy and they're shipped to your house and in one of these boxes like this big and you open up the plastic and all of a sudden they like expand into this giant thing. It's sort of the, the same thing with this in utero packaging kind of tight, tightness issue. And I'll also describe it to them as like basically the tibia, it's like they were born like with a twist in it, like you were wringing out a towel. Uh, and then finally, going down to the bottom here, metatarsis adductus. So that's the internal rotation or adduction of the forefoot relative to where the heel is. And you get this kidney bean shaped foot. Um, and this is another one of those in utero kind of packaging things. Half the time it's going to be bilateral. It's about the same in males and females. And it's really common. It's about one in a thousand births. Uh, probably the more important thing to remember about metatarsis adductus is that it's associated with other conditions about 15 to 25 percent, 15 to 20 ish percent of the time. Um, it's associated with DDH, which is something you really don't want to miss. Um, and it's also got an association with torticollis, so that's sort of like the trifecta, trifecta of in utero packaging stuff. So, when we talk about intone, it really comes from either femur, tibia, or the foot itself. And so, you can figure out what it is in about like 30 to 60 seconds on your physical exam. Um, and you can actually show the parents what you're looking at at the same time. So uh, it, it helps with uh, patient and parent counseling. So this is kind of a chart that I'll use frequently. Um, and it looks at hip internal and external rotation, which is related to femoral antiversion. 
something called the five foot angle, which we'll look at, which is really uh, an estimation of internal tibial torsion, a heel bisector line, which really is an estimation of metatarsus adductus, and then a foot progression angle, which kind of uh, quantifies how much in towing there is. And this is all done in a prone position. So you put the child on the bed, put them on their belly, um, and you can do all of this very, very quickly. So when we're assessing femoral antiversion, we're looking at that hip internal and external rotation. So here you see the child lying down on the ground, and then basically in your mind's eye, you drop a line from the ceiling uh, down to the knee, and then you take a line where the uh, uh, tibia points outwards as you bring the legs out from midline or internally rotate the hips. Sometimes it's a little confusing because it looks like the feet are pointing outwards, but that's actually the hips turning inwards. So you can see here that would be about 50 degrees of internal rotation. Whereas this would be external rotation. Again, drop a line down the, from the ceiling to the knee, draw a line from along the tibia itself, and then you see there's about 50 or so degrees of external rotation here. This would be a more pathologic version of that, where the femurs internally rotate about 90 degrees and externally rotate about uh, 15 degrees. Now, the five foot angle is going to look at internal tibial torsion. So in determining this, you drop a line basically right down the thigh as after you flex the knees to 90 degrees. Um, you drop a line down the middle of the foot, wherever the foot is pointing, and you can either see that that's going to be an internal pointing of the foot or externally points the foot out will be either internal tibial torsion or external tibial torsion. So in this case, it's about 30 degrees internal. And then the heel bisector line is, if you take the heel, this is looking at metatarsal, you take the heel in between your fingers, and you draw a line straight up the foot out to the toes, it really should intersect around the second toe or between the second and third toe. Whereas if it falls lateral to that, it means the forefoot is uh, rotated in. And uh, you can see on this one where it's really between about the third and the fourth toes. And then finally, the foot progression angle, um, watching all these kids walk is really important. Watch them walk down the hall. You basically, this will, quantify how much in towing because it can be additive from both the femur and uh, tibia, which it often is. Um, and the, so you drop a line basically right down the middle of the floor, you look where your feet are pointing, and that's going to be either internal or external. And this is very helpful. All these measurements, um, they're, they're really just helpful for either serial exams when patients are coming in initially saying how bad it is, and then six months or a year later that it's not any better. You can kind of pull us out and say, oh, no, it actually is better. It's just hard to see when you see these kids so often. Um, and it's also, so it's mainly helpful for serial exams and then just kind of also quantifying things. It doesn't really matter, though, because the treatment is going to be the same for everything. It's basically observation time, time, and then when you think you haven't given it enough time, you get a little bit more time. And then, so how long do we wait? We expect spontaneous resolution. Uh, and for metatarsis adductus, most of that's going to sort of work itself out by the time the kid is one. Uh, it can be up to about three or four years old. For internal tibial torsion, that's really going to work itself out by about four years old. And then femoral antiversion, that's the last one. It brings up the rear around like nine-ish. Um, and then one of the things that parents are always asking about are going to be, uh, what can we do for this? Can we do physical therapy? Can we do some special shoes? Can we do orthopedic shoes? Can we, I need some braces. Um, we even have kids come in that the parents have been putting like the left shoe on the right foot and the right shoe on the left foot for like a year. Uh, but really none of that stuff works. So our job is basically to reassure parents. Basically we tell them they're not going to be stuck that way forever. They're going to get better. Um, there's never been any association with in towing relating to frequent trips and falls. The frequent trips and falls really are usually just because your kids are learning how to walk and run still. Um, there's never been any association with in towing, long term problems with arthritis or jo uh, joint problems. And then the in towing is definitely not going to be an issue with uh, athletics going forward. And in fact, if they don't believe me, then I'll sometimes reference this study where. Um, I'm not saying it's the best study in the world, 
Uh, but there, there is some evidence to suggest that uh, you may have better sprinting ability if you have like a little bit of infilling. And really the, the conclusion of this study or this paper um, was really just for, as they say, this information may reduce anxiety of parents of children with internal tibial torsion. Um, so that's really what we used this for. And when they're still a bit skeptical, that's when we that's when I tell them, well, we can change it, but the only way to change it right this second is going to be surgery. So what that means is I got to cut the bone and then I got to untwist it and then I got to put some metal in there to hold it together. I'm not suggesting that we do this, but that's sort of the answer right now. And by that time, parents usually kind of back up a little bit. Um, just a word about W sitting. The um, it, it's associated with femoral inversion. We kind of talked about that, but really it's not. It, it's the, the way, the reason that they can sit like that is because of that they naturally have the femoral inversion. It's not an effect of, uh, it's not a cause of the femoral inversion. And unless you're really sitting like this for like 20 hours a day or something like that, then it's really, it's not going to cause any long-term problems. So I say to the parents, you know, you have enough things to worry about. This should not be one of them. Let them sit like that. And of course, you know, there's exceptions to every rule. So with this rule of wait, wait, and wait some more. Um, there are some times when it doesn't get better on its own. And that mainly is with neuromuscular conditions like cerebral palsy or spina bifida because there aren't normal muscle forces across these joints because we don't expect them to necessarily get better. So that creates a whole separate um, treatment algorithm. Uh, the only other kind of time we are talking uh, about this, these exceptions to the rules with metatarsus reductus if you see a medial skin crease here, um, it indicates a bit of a more severe deformity. And then we get a little bit more aggressive, usually just with a couple of serial casts and maybe some abrasion. And then if, and this is very, very rare, if they have persistent deviation after we expect it to get better on its own, and it's associated with things like knee pain, there's something called miserable malalignment syndrome that we'll hear about later on in the evening, um, or really, really unacceptable cosmesis. And we're talking about now kids that are maybe coming into their teenage years that actually come into me themselves asking for help, not really their parents asking for it. Then we can do surgery for this. And by surgery, we're talking about derotation osteotomy. So basically cut the bone, untwist it, and put something in there to hold it together while it heals. And this works very well. It's a very powerful surgery. And when children need it, um, they typically are very, very happy with the uh, results. So intoning is one of the most common things that we see, probably one of the more common things that you guys hear about in the office. Um, so hopefully this gave you a, a few tips or, or things so that you can kind of tell the parents or look for on your exam um, to put their fears at ease. Uh, but we also understand that sometimes you have those parents that are going to ask you again and again and again and again. So we're always happy to see those kids in the office and kind of back you up on these things. So next up is going to be Dr. Barbara Minkowitz, and she's going to be talking a little bit more about alignment, but more with the uh, knock knees and bow leg version. So can we bring up her?